Uh, hi guys, I'm Sam Flegel, and uh, I'm the Liberty Con Artist Guest of Honor this year. Um, and I, I, the panel is called The Art of Sam Flegel, which I should know a lot about, I guess, being Sam Flegel. Um, but uh, I, I'm never exactly sure uh, what people want to hear uh, about the art. So what I'm going to start with is just telling you a little bit about my background, kind of how I ended up doing this for a living, and then take it from there. Uh, so, well, I, I guess if we go go way back uh, to, to my childhood roots, I loved comic books and Dungeons and Dragons probably too much. Uh, and that's sort of how I ended up doing all this stuff. Um, but, but more specifically, uh, when I was in high school, uh, I saw the, the movie Toy Story, uh, which uh, dates me some, but most of you guys look older than me anyway, so it's fine. Um, and uh, when, I, when I was at that momentous moment that all 17 and 18 year olds must face where they decide what they're going to do with the rest of their life at the very wise age of 18, um, I thought, I'm going to be an animator. So I went to school, I went to Mississippi State University, if we have any state fans out there. Um, and uh, I majored in graphic design with emphasis in animation. All artists start with their, their first two years are the same for everybody. So we're talking drawing one, design one, basics of painting, those sorts of classes. And it doesn't matter what you're going to be, sculptor, photographer, graphic designer, animator, everybody gets a solid foundation in the arts. And then your junior year, you switch to your major classes. So in my junior year, I took my first animation class, and I hated it. It was the worst ever. Uh, I don't know how much any of you know about animation, but if you know anything about computer programming, you actually know a lot more about animation than you might think, because animating is very much like computer programming and not very much like drawing at all. Um, we had this, the reason I ended up at Mississippi State is they had this million dollar lab that could recreate Pixar movies and it was a really uh, big draw and we had master's students going on who eventually worked on the Lord of the Rings movies when those came out and so the, the school was one of the places to be for animation in the early 2000s and that's why I went there and lo and behold I did not like it. Um, so at that point, you know, I was invested and well, I'll just, I, you know, I'll get the graphic design degree and, you know, I can go make logos and stuff and, and that'll all work out. Um, and, and at that point, that's when I feel like uh, a, a part of my life and most of my 20s sort of went on, on autopilot for the most part, where it's like, well, I got this graphic design degree, I'll go get a graphic design job, which is, which is what I did. I worked for a record distribution company. Um, my first job was an art director for a small distribution company in 2004, which if any history buffs out there, you know 2004 was not the best time to be in the record distribution industry. Um, so uh, my first job was for a, a failing record company, a record distribution company that, that used to make off their money on, off of selling music, which particularly in 2004, people didn't buy music. Uh, so then I moved on, uh, after about a year of that, I moved on to working for the U.S. Stamp and Sign Company, which I know all of you know their work. You may not know you know your work because if you've ever seen a bathroom sign or an open and closed sign, there's about a 30% chance it was a sign that we made at U.S. Stamp and Sign. If you've ever been to Staples and Office Max or Office Depot, any of the big box chains, uh, you've seen my work in person. So I guess the artist Sam Flegel and my public debut started uh, in, in men's rooms. Um, <laughs> so, um, but what, what I found over time is um, working, working for that company uh, put me in contact with, with vice presidents of marketing and, and CEOs and I became in this world of marketing and office jargon that just felt more and more foreign to me. Uh, and, after I'd been working there uh, two and a half, three years, um, my wife finally finally came to me and said, Sam, you, you, you're, you're miserable and you're making everyone else around you miserable. You have to figure out what you love or this, you know, this is not gonna, gonna work out. And um, at the time, obviously, that was a very difficult, very emotional thing to go through, but I, I thank my wife so much for that honesty of being like, you know, you're, you're being shitty to people, stop being shitty, you know? <laughs> like, Oh yeah, that's that's a good idea. So I, I had to think about how I ended up in that point because very much like from 18 to at this point I was about 27. So we're talking about almost a decade. 
it was just like, well, you know, they say you go to college, so I went to college, and I, I like art, so I got an art degree, and now I have an art job, sort of, but it's really designing bathroom signs, and, you know, you just, you just end up on this path, and I look back, and I, I almost didn't, I didn't know myself, or, or um, you know, how I got there, almost, um, so I started thinking really hard about, well, what, what did I like? Why did I want to set down this path in the first place? Because I, I like animation, but was it really the animation I liked or was it the storytelling? And, and why did I like telling stories? Because I love role-playing games and, and card games like Magic the Gathering and comic books and superheroes. And it, but it wasn't just the stories, it was the visual storytelling that, that drew me in. And, and then I thought, man, Sam, you haven't actually drawn in almost five years. So ever since I got out of school, um, out of college, there was, I mean, I, I do like logo sketches, sort of, but I wasn't really drawing for the pleasure of drawing. And so I changed that. That's the first thing I changed after the talk with my wife is I, I made the, the choice of I'm going to try and draw every day, but at a minimum, I'm going to draw five days a week and, and set out that goal. And at first, it was almost like someone had broken my hand because there was this thing that I had done so long in my life, and in my head, I thought I was good at it. Like, oh yeah, I, I considered myself an artist and a, like someone who drew, and then I sat down to draw, and it's not exactly like they say, you know, it's as easy as riding a bike, it all comes back, and it, it just didn't. Um, it took me almost a year to get back to where I was when I was in school. Um, also, a, a piece of advice for anyone who's considering a career in the arts, I did not just quit my day job. I didn't just say, oh yeah, I don't need money anymore and, and you know, screw you guys, I'm going home. Um, I, I kept my job and I began looking for other work, uh, but I, I started drawing every day. And then I started a club I call Creative Club. And so I got some writer friends and some artist friends and we all got together and, and um, some gamer friends too. And my, my gamer friends started making up a world to be at the time, um, I think fourth edition D and D was just out, so we were going to make a fourth edition D and D world, and uh, then uh, the writers started writing in that world, and and the gamers started making up rules in that world, and as the artists, we started drawing the characters from that world and, and the cultures and the settings. And what was really great about that was it it gave me a reason to, I guess, be beholden to someone else. You know, like the writers were expecting to see something that when we got together the next week. And, and the same with the writers. As the artists, we were expecting new stuff to draw, uh, you know, back and forth. So it was a collaboration project, and that that really helped me a lot, being able to collaborate with other people. Um, but that reached a point as well where um, it just it just fizzled out. It, it, it had run its course, and I was ready to to move on. And so uh, I started putting together a portfolio, and I went to conventions. The first convention I ever took a portfolio to was. Dragon Con uh, back in 2009. It was my first time going to Dragon Con, but it was the first time I was going to do conventions as a, as a business. And I, I, of course, made some really bad choices about what to put in my portfolio. I, I uh, you see students do this a lot, or, or younger artists. And I, now that I'm on the other side of the table and I do a lot of portfolio reviews, they come with the uh, like, oh yeah, there's a like I had a picture of a, I mean, a hot girl with a gun. That's a good that's a good image. Let's have that, and then probably some zombies. People like zombies, and so I, I wasn't so much thinking about what I wanted to draw or paint. Just like these are things that are marketable. I should do them and put them in a portfolio, and that's how you get work. And it, it's really not how you get work. But what it did is start a dialogue, and so I would go up to people whose art I admired, often the special guests and and other attending professional artists, and I I'd have them critique my portfolio. And um, for a long time, I, I really resented the time I spent in marketing. Um, at this time, I, I switched to working at Whole Foods Market, and I was uh, the store artist. So I made all the signs and banner material. Every Whole Foods actually has a graphic designer in their building. That's one of the reasons why when you walk in that grocery store and you're like, wow, it really looks good in here. Why does this grocery store look so much better? It's because every Whole Foods hires an artist, and it's actually a really great company to work for. There, there's a reason there. In like the top 15 or 17 on Forbes best companies to work for, but so I had switched to that at that point, which which helped a lot. Um, but then you know going to conventions and and I, I I was resenting the time I'd spent in marketing. But one thing it gave me is when you work in marketing, you get a, everybody works on a logo, like all the graphic designers in the department. Then you tack it up on a board, and the execs come in and they just put check marks on stuff. And you know you could have worked on something all week, and I ah, know that's not the one. 
And so I got used to the art being separate. You know, so many artists get caught up in the idea of like putting their soul in the work that when someone critiques it, they can't take the critique. And I didn't have that problem. And I didn't realize that was an asset at the time, but looking back, I can say that was such a huge asset and a, and a benefit that I gained from my time in, in the marketing departments. So when I got the critiques from these professionals, I started a blog, and it's still up if you guys want to check it out. On my website, you can go to samplegal.com, and the blog is called Artist Journey, and I, I started it in 2009. And, uh, I would just post about, well, this is what this artist said sucked about my work, and here's you know me working on it to change it. And uh, so you think about that, 2009 is actually not that long ago. Uh, and that's when I got started uh, in this business. And if you look at those early paintings, I'm not gonna show them to you, but if you wanna go find them yourself, they're still there. Um, they're, they're not so great. Um, so the, this journey is really, at this point, only about a five or six year journey as a professional artist. The, something else happened uh, in, in 2010, my daughter was born, and my wife and I talked. I'd gotten more serious about the art, hadn't gotten any really big jobs yet, but I, I had set up a sign at a convention uh, saying, I'll draw you as a zombie, doing zombie portraits. And uh, I, it was at Hypericon in Nashville, Tennessee, which is a small, small local convention. I live in Nashville. And I did nine or ten little zombie portraits. Didn't sell any prints, but that, that worked well. Also, thinking back, if you think about what was going on in 2009, like Zombieland had just come out, and it was right before Walking Dead was going to start. I didn't plan it that way, but it's one of those things where you're like, that worked out nicely for me. So then I went to Gen Con and set up a sign saying, I'm going to do zombie portraits, and I did 84 over Gen Con weekend. And so my wife and I are like, wow, like you actually made a decent paycheck in a weekend in a convention and in 2010 we're gonna have a kid so why don't you be the stay-at-home dad do the conventions when you're able to once a month on, on a weekend and and we'll see what happens and what happened is my kids now five and I never stopped going to conventions and the art just kept getting better because suddenly I had the time to work on it um, I also attended several workshops. I, I, I didn't get here on, on my own. Uh, in particular, I went to something called the Illustration Masterclass, which collects um, some amazing talent. I don't know if you guys are familiar. Certainly, some of you know names like Boris Vallejo and Julie Bell, Dan DeSantos, Donato Giancola, Rebecca Gay is the one who put this thing together, Greg Manchester, and these are the core faculty. The year I, first year I went, James Gurney was the special guest who did Dinotopia. And so if you're into art at all, essentially gods and rock stars run this workshop. And I learned more about oil painting and the business of art in seven days than in an entire year of, of art school. And I've been back three different times and it, it was crazy. Like my wife would talk about it, how I was posting up stuff on Facebook while I was, was there and people were like, holy crap, is that actually you drawing that? Like, how did you get that much better in such a short amount of time? It's just this boot camp experience where nothing else is happening. And after attending the first one, um, I, I had been working digitally. I switched to working traditionally. I, I love oil paint, and I, I don't regret uh, focusing on oil painting at all. Um, and uh, so I, I um, took the, the, the class. And then I went to Gen Con again, and I was still doing the zombie portraits thing. This was about the third year I'd been doing zombie portraits work, and I had done a painting for, uh, oh, you guys know, Michael Blachik. I did a painting for Michael Blachik for his World of Euteria D&D uh, books. And uh, the art director for Fantasy Flight Games saw the painting and stopped, and I've met her several times. Zoe Robinson was her name. She kind of stopped and was like, wait, is this you? Yeah, but you, you do more than just the zombie portrait thing? Like, oh, oh yeah, this is, this is what I do. She said, this guy looks like he'd make a really great orc. Do you know anything about Warhammer Fantasy? And I was like, do I? Let me tell you about my 2,000 points of vampire counts in Ogre Kingdoms and my, my 40K Nurgle Army. It's great. <laughs> um, and so I got my first job uh, working for Fantasy Flight doing orcs. I got to do uh, called Da Immortals. And uh, the, these were a bunch of black orcs running up a hill, and there were dead goblins and elves and dwarves, and it was great. And I, I just loved it, and I sunk everything into it, uh, and I just, it really clicked. 
it ended up not only be using it in the card game, it ended up being featured as, featured as the box cover art for uh, that game. And, and pretty much ever since then, I, I've been working professionally. And it, it went from um, working at Fantasy Flight on Warhammer Fantasy. Now I work on their Warhammer 40K card line uh, called Conquest. Uh, working at AEG on List of the Five Rings. I've worked for Hero Games doing books like the Monster Hunter International Employees Handbook cover and doing, yeah, it was me, and doing um, the most recent Hero Games cover, which was Fantasy Hero Complete. Um, and so and now I'm in a point where the daughter's in school and I have even more time <laughs> to make paintings, but more than anything, um, I'm finally at a point after that three to five year stint where, where the money being made is equal or greater to what I was making when I had a regular job and I'm, I'm so happy and things with my wife are amazing and it's just it's a really great place to be. So that's sort of how I got here. Um, not so much specifically about the art. Um, a little bit more about the art specifically. Uh, I am an oil painter and I work traditionally. Uh, I typically start with a gray tone drawing. Uh, well, I start with really small little thumbnail sketches and then work that up. I do work from reference photos. I, I work with models. I often use my wife and friends. Uh, Mike and Paul Blachik have been models as has uh, Laura Blachik, Mike's wife, my wife. Um, a number of people you guys know from the con circuit uh, appear in my paintings. Um, and, and that's one of the fun things about being on the con circuit is all the, the crazy books that you meet along the way. Um, and then I, I take the reference photos and take my initial sketch, which is done out of my head, and then I start fixing things. Uh, then I do that gray tone drawing, and then I have the gray tone drawing. I used to transfer it by hand. Uh, now they're able to actually print on a gessoed board, which I, I paint on board, uh, masonite board, rather than canvas. I really hate the texture of canvas. It, it screws with the brushes, it drives me nuts. Um, I actually get extra smooth. Most artists who work on the same stuff I work are like, ah, it's like painting on glass. How do you even do this? I'm like, I love it. So, um, but that's, that's just art in general. I, I'll, something else I thought too when I was getting started is like, is there a magic pen or a brush that's the perfect thing to use? And really the answer is if you're, if you're thinking about getting into art or you're wondering yourself like, what, what brushes does he use or what paint does he use? It doesn't really matter. What I recommend is just get all the brushes and try them all and see which one feels right to your hand. Same with the paper you want to use and the board. And so for me, that's, that's what works. And so I have the drawing printed out on the board. And this does two things for me. One, it lets me do the drawing a little smaller. I do it at 12 by 16 for like an 18 by 24 painting. And so I can be very detailed at 12 by 16. And when it's blown up, it, the same level of detail is achievable with brushes. Because obviously you can get a little more tighter on your detail with a pencil than you could with a brush. But because I scale it up, it ends up being a, a ratio that works out well. And then I do the oil painting over the top of that first layer. The cool thing about that first layer I found out recently too is it's actually oil-based ink that they use to print. So it actually, my drawing ends up becoming the first layer of oils on the board. And then as you just keep building oils on, on top of that, you're just mixing the surface. So um, yeah, it, it's, it's really great and um, able to do so much time saving because of that process. Um, not you, you, either you used to have to use a projector or do the thing where you put charcoal on the back and carefully basically draw the whole thing a second time on the on the canvas. And um, so yeah, it's, it's really good. And then the oil paintings, I also always get asked, how long does it take you to do a painting? Um, the, the drawing and sketching phase takes anywhere from eight to 20 hours. And that's from concept to a, a final drawing um, that preps the painting. And the painting itself takes anywhere from 60 to 200 hours. Um, typically, around 180 to 100 hours is typical for most pieces. And if you figure the average person works about 40 or 50 hours a week at their job, it's the same for me. I do about 40 or 50 hours of painting. So two weeks is right about that 80 to 100 hours mark. And what, what makes it take longer is more people. You have a big battle scene, more faces. Um, you know, more hands, that it just takes, add more and more time. Um, if you have a single figure on a fairly simple background, it can go very quickly. Much like the Liberty Con piece that I did, uh, even though it's very, very detailed, um, and her armor is very cool and, and has all that stuff in it, uh, it actually went relatively quickly because it's a fiery background and you can get away with a lot. It's not like a building where someone's going to say, that window doesn't look quite right. You know, it's fire, so it looks like fire. Um, and, and so there, 
those sorts of paintings can take more towards the 50 to 60 hours. And um, so yeah, so that's that's kind of how how I went from there. Um, at this point, I've been rambling for a while. I think yeah, about 20 minutes or so. So I, I'm going to start opening it up to questions. Do you guys have any questions about uh, my process or stuff you've seen uh, in the art show that you wanted a chance to ask more about? So, yeah. Um, you've got three of your prints up here on display. Mm -hmm. uh, what led you pick those three for your presentation? I don't remember which ones I have. Oh, so uh, the collector here, uh, this guy, uh, is a piece I did for Legend of the Five Rings. So I selected it to kind of show some of the game card art. Um, is, is that the same one that uh, Larry Corey and some of his group play? Yeah, it is actually. That's when, when I got the job to do the Monster Hunter cover, Larry was like, oh man, Sam, I know your work. Uh, I play L5R, and so it was it was really humorous uh, to go back and forth. Funny thing about that Monster Hunter job, I learned more about guns in the month I worked with Larry than in my entire life, <laughs> except for maybe on Friday uh, when we went shooting. <laughs> I learned a lot there too. Um, so I selected that one to kind of show the gaming work. I'm pretty sure that one's the Liberty Con picture. So I've selected because I'm pretty sure it is Liber Liberty Con. <laughs> and then what do I have on the in there? Oh. So on the far side there, I have uh, Troll T, um, and that, that was a project I did while I was at one of those workshops, and the project was to take an everyday event and turn it into a fantasy or sci-fi situation. And my wife and I drink a lot of tea at our house, so that's actually a portrait of my wife and I, uh, and uh, sharing, sharing tea. Uh, we both actually posed for the trolls, um, and uh, I, I just really loved the idea of seeing monsters doing... Uh, mundane things, you know, it's like in between, you know, scouring the land to hunt elves and, and men, you know, they have time to rest and they have a loving relationship, just like any monster couple. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I picked that one to show kind of a, a, a different uh, side. And I've got a few more and I'll, I'll switch them out um, at, at kind of as we go. So this is another one I did for uh, Legend of Five Rings card game. Uh, it's uh, called the Ogre Falconer. Um, but he's actually keeping vultures. I had to look up whether that was appropriate. Would he be a vulturer? But apparently falconry or falconer just refers to caring for any predator bird. Uh, and even though the, the vultures are scavengers, they still fall in the predator category. Um, but it was really fun. I, I always I love vultures. Um, they're actually one of my favorite animals. Uh, I love the way they look, the way they move. They're so fascinating uh, by by losing the feathers on their heads. They actually have become a more efficient animal for what they do because their heads can squeeze through like ribs to get to the good meat and pull back out. And they're going to be covered in blood and gristle, but it doesn't get stuck on their feathers to weigh them down or prevent them from flying. They're able to get those long necks deep into things. And just the idea of like over time, this creature evolved to be really good at doing what it does, even though what it does is pretty nasty. Uh, I just, I, don't know, I love the animal and the way it looks and, you know, you, you give anybody a pet vulture in a game or a fantasy setting and suddenly people are like, I don't know about that guy. So I also love, like, the connotation that it, that it brings and I just imagine this, this ogre fellow um, being, being, you know, like a ranger basically, but instead of keeping all the lovely animals of the forest, he takes care of the animals that are more like him. Kind of, I guess kind of like Shrek, you know, like he's more of an onion than a parfait. Um, so uh, that, that was that piece, and for a lot of my gaming stuff, I end up with undead, I end up with uh, humanoids, you know, ogres, trolls, monsters, uh, and it's, yeah, I love doing them mostly, and, and when you find an artist and figure out what he loves to do, and then you hire them to do that, the results are amazing. So, <laughs> well, a lot of times you get people who are like, oh man, your work is amazing, I love what you do, could you do something completely different? And those jobs don't work out so well. And early in my career, I'd take them, because early in your career, you're just like, money for drawing, yes. But you learn over time, when you take those jobs that don't fit, you end up with a bad painting, the client's not happy, you've been struggling through painting something you hate. Um, and and to, the career as an artist, to also do something, take something you love and make it something you hate, in a career where there's like not exactly a 401k plan, or all those safety nets that exist in another job that might be worth putting up with misery, uh, it just doesn't work out. No. Do you use models? Uh, the, the modeling phase always comes in uh, kind of 
second or third step, the first step being the, the really small thumbnails, then I do a larger sketch. Uh, I, I used to go to reference a little sooner, but I found that if I go to reference too soon, I lose the heart of the drawing. Uh, my, my work, um, I refer to it as stylized realism, because while it, they are realistic to, per se, they also have a caricature about them, um, that it's not quite the same that you'd see. Like a, a good example, I guess, would be like familiar with the work of Donato Giancola. His stuff is realism. I mean, he's painting Lord of the Rings, but if he was painting scenes from the Christian myths, he would be like a Renaissance painter, essentially. Um, so for, for me, I, there's a little more, I don't know, I get lackey quality or humorous quality. And, and I found I lost that if I went to reference too quickly. But once I've got that initial sketch down, I definitely go to reference and try to get my model to pose as much like the sketch I've done as possible. And then you start realizing like, ooh, that hand is just wrong. Because some people say like, well, that's, that's my style. That's how I draw hands. Well, your style is wrong. Um, that's, that's one thing about art schools that when, when I went to art school, this was still a problem. I understand it's changing some because people are getting a little tired of paying to go to school and, and realizing they don't actually have a job when they come out. Um, and that was one of the things that was great about my school, even though it focused on graphic design, which ultimately wasn't my interest. We worked with professors who actually worked in the field. But in academia, I couldn't teach uh, because I don't have a master's degree. And so in the arts, you end up with these situations where academia teaches you how to be an art professor, not how to actually go out and be an artist and make money as an artist. So um, anyway, I got way off on a tangent there. Um, so uh, with, with the reference, you know, you, it, it lets you fix those things. It also lets you see stuff when, when you really start looking at costuming and folds. As much as possible, I try to put people in outfits that are at least similar to what I'm going for. Um, you know, when I, I, uh, I wish I had the Monster Hunter cover. I didn't, I didn't bring it in. I actually have the big painting hanging in the art show if you haven't had a chance to see it. The original is here this weekend, the original painting. Uh, and for that one, they're all wearing combat gear. So I had my friends put on uh, leather jackets if they had them. We put on sports uh, elbow gear and, and knee pads and stuff for soccer players. And, um, you know, it, it gave the feel. It let me take all that information and turn it into sort of that futuristic military armor that they wear, uh, you know, when they go out shooting vampires in the face. Uh, and so that's, that's it, it, I'm not going to have exactly, because I was like, I don't have a samurai helmet that would be thousands of dollars to own a historical samurai helmet, but you can put someone in a hat and get it kind of close. Um, a lot of times, the really important thing with the samurai helmet is the visor that's coming forward. So I've even just had the person wear like a card shark hat, you know, where it's the open hat with the visor, and it casts that shadow over the face. And you start looking at those things, and, and you start observing in a way where like you really see how cloth works or how a material is there and the texture of it because skin and cotton and leather and wood all have a different feel and that's where the realism uh, comes in that's why I say stylized realism but yeah definitely use reference and it's so important uh, for a long time uh, art it was sort of a secret that people used reference Frank Frazetta said he didn't use reference. Well, Frank Frazetta died a few years ago. They found a massive reference folder uh, in his vault. And it turns out the reason he didn't have to tell people he used reference is because both him and his wife were bodybuilders and rather attractive people. So he just kept it in the family when he used the reference. It was pretty much always him and his wife, maybe later his kids, I don't know. But uh, he spread that myth that created this Frank Frazetta as the legend beyond the fact that his paintings are freaking amazing, the idea that like, yes, and he's just making it up all out of his head and not looking at anything, and that's not entirely true. Um, so, and, and as an artist, as you move forward, you can definitely start using reference less. The amount of reference that I used when I was first painting was much higher because, uh, you know, you just, when you've done something enough, you start to, to see it and, and understand it. but. Particularly starting out, it's so important for artists to use reference and, and really understand. And I mean, I, in college, of course, you do life drawing, and, and that's really the best way to learn the human form is, is to draw it live in front of you. Um, but, you know, I can't really afford to have a model stand in a football helmet holding a rake, pretending that they're a Viking for hours on end. So, you know, that's where photography comes in and, 
and help solve some of those problems. And if you've drawn enough from life, you learn the ways that photography makes stuff weird. Foreshortening obviously can get really weird in 2D, and so you, you learn to make those adjustments uh, as, as you go through. Uh, the, the, oh yeah. the last image on the end there is the, uh, the binding of Loki. And then the woman here is uh, Frigga the All-Mother. And so uh, if you went to the Liberty Con banquet, I talked about trying to marry my love of Norse mythology with the Statue of Liberty. Uh, and that's sort of how I arrived at, at Lady Liberty the Valkyrie, uh, which, is, which is a t-shirt. These two pieces are from my series on Norse mythology. Um, I call the series Faithful Signs. Um, and it's a collection of work all from, from the northern myths. And it's something that um, I, I, when I first got work as an illustrator, I just kept working for about a year and a half, two years. It was just like always the next job coming, always the next job coming. And then all of a sudden one summer, I hit this point and I, I didn't have a next job lined up. And I, I heard about stuff like this happening, but it was the first time it happened to me. And so I had this month on my schedule with, with nothing. By the end of the month, I had the next job and was, was moving right along. It wasn't a problem, but it was very weird to be in this place. Like, man, I've been painting solid for almost two years, and now I don't, what do I, I can paint anything. What do I want to paint? People have been telling me what to paint for so long. And it was really hard, actually. Uh, I spent a lot of time being like, oh, I like doing goblins, maybe I'll do some goblin thing for myself, or like a fairy tale piece, or uh, just all over the place. Um, and I started doing this picture of a fire mage. Uh, it started coming together, and then I realized it wasn't actually a fire mage, it was, it was Loki the fire god. Um, and I never actually ended up finishing the painting because I got more work and set it aside. But that, that little fire kind of kindled in the back of my mind. And the next time I was taking a class and had a chance to do a project for myself, I, I chose to do a piece on Odin. Um, and that painting's called Odin's Secrets. And it shows Odin with his two ravens that encircle the world and the head of Mimir, who uh, whispers him uh, from the land of the dead. Uh, and when I started that piece, um, I was just painting Odin, but by, by the end of it, through all the research I'd done, I'd rekindled my love of Norse mythology. Uh, back in college, I first encountered the Prose Edda, and I, I just devoured it, um, which if you're not familiar, is, is the original work by the historian Snorri Sturluson, who collected all the different, it's the reason we know so much about Odin and Thor specifically, because a lot of the stories are collected in there. There's also the Poetic Edda, and I just started reading and devouring these stories, and suddenly realizing, like, man, this is why I love Lord of the Rings so much and, and The Hobbit. Um, and, and the stories just spoke to me in a way that like the Christian myths and a lot of other mythologies just didn't speak to me because they take place in deserts. And I don't really know about a desert, but you talk about misty mountains. I, I've <coughs> seen misty mountains and large forests and, and traveling. And it just spoke to me in a way that just really just invoked my imagination. And obviously... The, the Nordic myths really since since Tolkien sort of revitalized interest in them. Um, and, and there was a group before, obviously, with Wagner and the Ring Cycle uh, in the late 1800s. They've been inspiring people for a really long time, actually. Um, but they had that effect on me. And I just, once I'd finished that Odin painting, I wanted to do more. And so I did. I just kept doing more. And then it got to the point where people started seeking me out. And the Binding of Loki uh, was commissioned by someone uh, who loved my, my series on the Norse myths and wanted to see what I would do with the story of Loki, which I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but the, the story is that uh, Loki has been responsible for the death of one of the gods. Uh, he, he caused the death of Baldr. He didn't do it himself, but he made it happen. And the gods are finally fed up with all of Loki's mischief, and so they, they capture him. He turns into a fish, but Lord, uh, Thor manages to catch him with a net and uh, then wrestles him down, and they take him beneath the earth, and they take three stones and, and Odin punctures a hole in each of the three rocks and then Odin turns one of Loki's son into a wolf and Loki's wolf son then devours his brother, Loki's other son, and they take his entrails and they feed the entrails through the holes in the stone and bind Loki down 
to the stones, and because he's bound with his own blood, it becomes a fetter that he's unable to break as Odin begins chanting the runic spell to make it so. And of course, Loki can't break out of Thor's arms to stop this in the first place. And the, the woman, the white woman to the side is a, a giantess, the goddess Skadi, goddess of vengeance and snowshoes, which I imagine if you lived in Norway it would be a lot more impressive. It sounds a little silly, but in, in you know, 800 uh, AD, snowshoes were probably pretty, pretty awesome technology. Um, and she um, uh, had, had been one of Loki's lover and, and actually really liked Loki, and so she felt the most betrayed. And so as the goddess of vengeance, she takes a poisonous snake and places it above Loki's head so that it will drip venom down into his face. And in the background of this piece, see the woman off to the far left, and that's Sijin, Loki's wife. Um, and in this piece, it's in the moment of all of it happening. But once Loki's bound and the snake is placed above his head, Sijin holds a bowl over his face and collects the venom. But eventually the bowl fills up, and she's forced to throw out the venom. And um, Loki writhes in pain as the venomous snake's like acid on his face. And the I, end of the legend is, and that's where earthquakes come from, is it's when Sijin has to pour out the bowl. It's, it's Loki writhing. Um, but I, I, I love, and it's a great story. It's, there's a lot in the myth, too, and a lot that on the surface you don't see. The first thing being, like, it sounds really horrible to us. You know, that, yeah, Loki screwed up, but did he really deserve to turn one of his kids into a wolf and murder the other's son? But that goes back to that concept of being from a different culture. And, and in uh, Germanic culture at that time, uh, the sins of the father were very much the sins of the son. And so Loki had dishonored his entire family. And so it, it was very common for if a father... Uh, had, had done something like murder in a tribe, the whole family could have been punished in some way for the father's crimes. And this was true regardless of, of your relatives. So the idea of being a close-knit family was very much a, not just about the love and bond of, of being a family, but being a clan and being a tribe and recognizing that your actions affect your clan and affect your tribe. And I just find that to be a really powerful notion it's a gruesome story, but I think we all could benefit from the idea of recognizing that our actions affect a lot more than just you know us and ourselves, that, that we are a part of a greater whole. Um, so I really enjoy that aspect of the story. And then in this particular piece, I had originally had a different position with Sijin, but uh, I, I was having a really hard time capturing what she would be feeling. Um, because Sijin... Um, we, we don't know specifically what she was goddess of. Uh, the goddesses aren't mentioned as clearly as the gods because the books were written primarily by uh, uh, Christian monks and historians working with Christian monks. Um, you were allowed to write about gods even at, in the mythological sense, but goddesses were considered threatening to the church, and so the way you could write about them was censored a lot more. And because of that, we lost a lot to, to history. Um, but what we know about Sijin is that she is the dutiful wife. And so as the dutiful wife, she recognizes that her husband is an outlaw and has broken the law and deserves to be punished. And that what's happening to her children is just, but she's also a mother. And what a horrible thing to look on and see your family destroyed by your husband's actions. And all she can do, in, in this piece I have her, she's, she's sobbing, crying, but she's holding that bowl because she knows that it is her duty to stand by her husband and, and um, take that role. And as I got more into the story, for me, the piece, The Binding of Loki, actually became a lot more about Sijin. And, and I, yeah, it's got all that, the epic action, and Thor is very strong and... and that's what people expect from the story, but, but I really got into looking in the background. And, uh, Laura Blachek actually is the one who posed for Sijin. I really struggled with showing grief. It's not an emotion that I get into very much. A lot of my paintings are very much like, ah, we're fighting stuff, and like dragons are cool, and you know those sorts of uh, more fun emotions. And so going to that little bit of a sadder and darker place was hard for me. And by, by working with Laura, she uh, does some acting classes, and. Uh, has actually been in some music videos and stuff, and uh, 
but working with a woman who understood how a woman would feel grief and getting her to take the pose. You asked me earlier about reference. This is the one of the recent times where I actually did it in reverse, and I took the reference of Laura and did drawings based on the reference in order to capture that emotion because she showed grief in, in a way that I just couldn't have done out of my head at all. And for me, I feel like it makes the piece. Um, when people really get into it and understand the story, it just it, it elevates it to a level that I couldn't have gotten to on my own. Um, so yeah, that, that piece was a, a pretty big breakthrough piece for me. Then um, this other one here, uh, Frigga the All Mother, also from uh, that series on Norse mythology, uh, came about because uh, the Odin piece that I spoke of earlier is one of the only paintings I have hanging in my house that's that's my painting. Um, like most artists, I sort of hate looking at my stuff after about six months. Um, I don't usually speak about it in, in those terms, but if you think about it, like with art, if you're getting better and you look back at what you did a year ago, you're like, okay, I see what I could have done better that I didn't know back then. And that's a good thing, because you're making progress. And it, in one sense, it's very satisfying. But in the other sense, I don't necessarily want all those paintings hanging up in the house. Um, but for me, Odin was such a breakthrough, both, um, for, for me, sort of spiritually and uh, as an artist, that it, it in a way, it sort of transcends the skill level that I was at when I did it. It's like a milestone piece for me. Uh, my wife requested, well, if we're going to have Odin hanging in the house, we need to have Odin's wife, Frigga, also. So uh, this painting was for my wife uh, and is now the other painting that we actually have hanging in our house. And um, it shows uh, Frigga the All Mother, who's such an interesting character. You know what, I have another piece I ended up doing a Frigga I'm gonna put up as well and kind of talk about them side by side here. I didn't intend to do two paintings of Frigga, but we'll, we'll get to that. So uh, o Odin's wife Frigga is uh, the, the central goddess figure, queen of the gods, hearth and home, uh, a lot of those similar things that you associate it with kind of the, the generic goddesses. And again, there's a lot less written about Frigg than there is written about Odin. Um, but some of the things that, that you can pull from, from the lore is that it was um, the job of the woman uh, who's the head of the household, she kept the keys. Um, in in uh, Germanic society, Icelandic specifically, we have a lot of their legal codes, that they actually, the laws that they've written down, and a lot of our Western concepts of even trials are actually based originally on our Germanic roots as they went with the Anglo-Saxons and the Normans to England and kind of developed into, um, like, obviously our trial system is different, but you can see the roots of it. And one of the things that was unique to Germanic society is that women could divorce their husbands, um, specifically for things like spousal abuse and um, uh, grievous offenses. And if you think about the time period, we're talking like, you know, seven, eight hundred to one thousand, that's very forward thinking uh, for, uh, I got the five minute mark, all right, for, for women's rights. Um, and so uh, I, I wanted to capture a lot of that in, in the piece. So she's got the keys because she's the keeper of the household. Um, in the background, there's small children uh, and, and their spirits because uh, it's thought that when children died young, they went to Frigga, who was the great mother who looked after them forever in, in uh, the afterlife. And so uh, as I was finishing this piece, my, my Norse mythology work had gotten more and more recognized online. And I was contacted by the Odinist group in the United Kingdom who had purchased a 16th century abbey and had gotten permission from Newark in England, not Jersey, uh, to convert the, the abbey, restore it, but restore it as a pagan temple to the Norse gods. And I was asked to do a painting that now hangs in their, I guess, chapel? I, I don't know the proper term uh, for the altar space there. Uh, and so they contacted me to do a painting of Frigg as well. And, and in that piece, they wanted a bit more subdued. They didn't want me to veer. A lot of this painting is about me doing research outside of what's written in the lore about the role of women and trying to bring that into Frigga, but they wanted only things that were mentioned in the lore. And, and the one thing that's mentioned specifically is that Frigg has a cask, uh, and in this cask 
she places all the secrets, and she actually knows as much as her husband Odin, if not more, the difference being that Frigg never tells anyone her secrets. And I love that concept, again, of, of the way the role of, of a powerful woman and a leader in, in society is, is captured. Uh, I was really proud and, and honored that they picked me to be involved with that project at all, but um, that's how I, I ended up with those two pieces. Uh, so man, I'm, I just went a lot faster than I thought. So we only got five minutes left. It's one of the things that surprised me when I, and excited me when I first got into researching uh, Norse mythology is, is recognizing that in some form, all the way from the United Kingdom to Russia, uh, they all followed the same pantheon of gods. Like, we, we think of paganism as an, in a kind of an abstract sense of all these various little cultural deities, which is true to some extent. Odin had like thousands of names or hundreds of names, um, but there was one religion of Northern European people, and so if you had any Northern European ancestry whatsoever, which uh, I say most people do, uh, you know, then uh, you know it, it very much is a part of your culture and your ancestry as well, which is why I get really excited, uh, you know, researching and finding out where things like you just talked about actually come from. So I just got the stop sign, so I'm, I'm going to wrap this up. I also have a mailing list right up here. If you'd like to get updates about me and my artwork, please come sign up. I also have business cards. And thank you all so much for coming. I really had a good time. Thanks for listening. I'm Sam Flegel. If you like this, make sure to comment and subscribe. Thanks.